Hello there my RPG lovers and welcome to another video. Piranha Bytes loves to make RPG trilogies. The newest game from this studio came out just a couple of months ago and it was a direct sequel to Elex 1 from 2017. Judging by everything we know about this sequel and the history of the studio, we can say for sure that Elex 3 is inevitable. That will complete the Elex trilogy, just like they did with Gothic and Reason series. The first Reason game was a fresh beginning for this small developer. You not listening? Someone spit in your ear. Creating a brand new IP is always a big risk even when it comes to AAA games, let alone a small budget RPG from a studio with around 30 people. But Piranha Bytes already established a very loyal fan base with Gothic games even though Gothic 3 was considered to be a major disappointment, mainly because it felt unfinished. Then it got even worse with the awful standalone spin-off which was The Forsaken Gods. Even though that game wasn't developed by Piranha Bytes, it only added more fuel to the fire which Gothic 3 started. It seemed like everything was going downhill until we got a brand new game from this studio. Reason was a chance for a new beginning. This game was something entirely new from the Gothic developer, but they kept the same design philosophy which made their previous game so beloved. In a lot of ways, Reason felt like Gothic 1 and 2, but in a different skin. It's maybe not the game which the fans wanted, but the game which the fans needed. But isn't that terribly dangerous? That's because people expected to see another Gothic game from the studio, but unfortunately that was impossible. Back then, Piranha Bytes lost the license for the Gothic IP, although only temporarily. The license went to Joe Wood, which was the ex-publisher of Gothic games. Joe Wood got the rights to develop a game within the Gothic universe, so they hired a new studio to make Arcania. But that's a totally different story that we're going to talk about in the next video. Making a completely new game was the only option for Piranha Bytes, but it didn't seem like Reason was developed out of pure necessity. Judging by the general quality of this game, it seems like Piranha Bytes wanted to move on from the Gothic franchise anyway. However, Reason was not without its problems and some of them are quite big, especially in later chapters. Ironically, I think it suffers from similar issues that Gothic 3 had when it comes to feeling unfinished. Despite that, I still believe it's very much worth playing today, especially if you never played it before. So we'll talk about the good, the bad and everything I consider important about Reason 1 in this video. I completed the playthrough on my PC and I also played the infamous Xbox 360 version just to see how bad it actually was. Yeah, I'm suffering so you don't have to. You're welcome. Now let's go back to the beginning and start analyzing every major aspect of this game. You telling tales now? The reception of Reason was pretty decent in general, even though it was far from being a highly anticipated game. Well, it was decent on the PC at least. Like I said, the Xbox 360 port was absolutely terrible. But we'll talk about this version of the game a bit later in the video. Reason starts with a short cutscene which gives you a pretty vague introduction of what's going on in this world. Apparently, the gods were treating the people as slaves for a long time in this world so people eventually managed to banish them. Banishing the gods set in motion the sudden appearance of temple ruins all over the world. The main story is heavily revolved around these temples and you'll spend a lot of time exploring them in later chapters. And speaking of you, once again you get to control a nameless character, just like in Gothic games. There is basically no background story or any additional info about the character you play. It's entirely up to you to shape his personality through dialogue and different gameplay choices, which are quite prominent in this RPG. And even though the character customization system would fit perfectly with such RPG design, Piranha Bytes just refuses to include that feature in their games. I really think they don't realize how many people love customizing their own characters in RPGs. The last two games from this studio had a well-established main character with a rich backstory. When you have predetermined characters like Jax from Elex, Geralt of Rivia from The Witcher and so on, the lack of any customization options is more forgiving. However, Greedfall, for example, also had a predetermined character, but that didn't stop the developer from including a comprehensive character customization system. I think it's a missed opportunity with Reason because this feature alone would probably attract more people. Anyway, ever since the temples have risen from the ground, the Inquisition has set some very strict rules. The Inquisitor has his claws stuck deep into the flesh of this island, a firm grip on the harbour town and the monastery. Well, that's what he thinks. The Inquisitor Mendoza is featured in the intro cutscene where he tries to fight this big titan monster unsuccessfully. So he disappears from the boat, leaving the crew behind to perish, including you. 
but somehow you manage to survive and are stranded on this unknown island where the game begins. The island is called Faranga, although the name is rarely mentioned by anyone in the game, which is kinda weird. I had to check the damn wiki page, just to be sure about the name. This might seem like a nitpick, but I actually think it's really important to emphasize the name of the game world as much as possible, especially if it's a brand new RPG with a fresh lore. Luckily for reason, the map itself is amazing and very memorable, but we'll talk about the map design when we get to the gameplay. Like I said, the Inquisition has set some very strict rules ever since the temples have risen from the ground. No one is allowed to leave the island and it's basically illegal to be a free man. <laughs> Yeah, they really seem like great people, don't they? The guards brought you here because you transgressed the law. I didn't know it was forbidden to be outside the town. Ignorance is no excuse. The Inquisition is one of the joinable factions in the game and they are not playing around when it comes to their laws. There is a big chance to accidentally join them by just being curious while exploring the island. The higher members of Inquisition will attack you on sight and knock you down and drag you to the monastery by force. If that happens, you'll have no choice but to join them or reload a save game. However, Reason has a great subtle tutorial which will introduce you to a couple of very useful characters. Sarah is another survivor from the boat and she gives you some very basic gameplay tips and the first quest. Shortly after that, you'll meet Jen, who will give you some very useful tips about the island. And he can actually accompany you and show you the way to a couple of important locations. Jen is a member of the second biggest faction in the game, which is also joinable. People just refer to them as bandits or the Dawn's people. The Dawn was the leader of the harbor town, but when the Inquisition came, they took over the control of the city. Eventually, you'll have to make a choice between these two factions, but there are plenty of side quests to solve even before joining anyone. That's usually the case with all Piranabites games. I decided to join the Dawn's people on this playthrough because I'm pretty sure I beat the game with the Inquisition as a mage the last time I played Risen. I would say the process of joining the bandits feels more enjoyable, since you'll have to work for them quite a bit before you can join. Officially? Officially? Officially, yeah. Joining the Inquisition is basically instant, either by getting snatched or doing it voluntarily. Although I like how different these two factions are in general, it's not only the process of initiation which is different. The whole game feels a lot different depending on your faction choice. Although the main story for the last two chapters is almost identical, no matter whom you choose. And speaking of that, the game has four chapters in total. The first reason is definitely the shortest game that Piranha Bytes ever made, but it has a strong replay value. Maybe not as much as Gothic games, but you can get at least two very interesting playthroughs out of it. The sheer length of the game doesn't really matter that much to me if the game is good in general. But after completing Reason once again, I really feel like the game needed at least one more chapter. The first two chapters are mostly related to the faction of your choice and the optional side quests, while the last two chapters are heavily revolved around the main story of the game. You'll have to find out what's going on with the island and the mystery behind these ancient temples. The island is suffering from very frequent earthquakes and it's impossible to sail because of the aggressive storms. Not to mention the huge monster from the beginning cutscene that's probably still there. I will have a separate section where we talk about the spoilers for the main story. It's kinda hard to talk about it in depth without spoiling anything major. But to conclude my spoiler-free thoughts about the main story, it was interesting enough. I was really curious to find out what's really happening with the island, so it does a good job at keeping your attention. The thing is, I forgot the majority of the plot from the last time I played the game, although I still remembered how the game ends. So I guess it was not an extremely memorable main story, at least in my case. The lore of the game is actually very basic and it leaves a lot to be desired. I mean, sure, we got to see a couple of more recent games, but they went in a totally different direction and I was not a huge fan of that, especially when it comes to the setting of the game. If you ask me, the setting of the Reason 1 is way superior compared to its sequels. That could be a bit subjective because I prefer medieval slash fantasy settings in general. What's not so subjective is the quality of the main story in Piranha Bytes games. To be honest, Gothic games never had an amazing main story and Reason is not exactly any different. This might sound a bit corny, but when it comes to gothic games, it was always about the journey, not the destination. That's certainly not an excuse for the bad main story, but that's the thing, I don't think the main story in Reason is bad. The writing is decent and it was interesting to see what's going to happen next, but the lore itself is pretty bare bones. That's one of the reasons why I think that Reason 1 feels unfinished, but more about that later. The temple ruins contain many secrets. By the way, Piranabites have improved the quality of the main story in their newer games quite substantially. 
So yeah, it's about the journey and not the destination, right? Which brings us back to the beginning section of the game. Choosing where to go in the beginning will have a major impact on how you experience the game. Joining the bandits in the swamp offers you the most freedom when it comes to exploration, as long as you avoid the members of the Inquisition. The game is not afraid to impose a couple of strict rules, which will limit your freedom of movement on the islands. For example, if you end up in the monastery, you won't be able to leave until a certain point. You'll have to do a couple of quests first, and then you'll be free to leave and explore the islands. Harbor Town takes this concept even more serious. Once you get in, you won't be able to get out that easily because it's officially closed. There are a couple of very interesting quests related to this, but I won't spoil anything. By the way, this place has a ton of quests to solve, so it will keep you busy for quite some time. These restrictions might seem a bit frustrating at first, but once you get your freedom back, it feels amazing and rewarding. Come to think of it, it's very effective gameplay design, if done properly. The game briefly shows you the freedom you have on the island, and then eventually it takes it away. It would be a different story if these locations that limit your freedom are boring, but they're not. I think that Harbor Town is way more interesting than the monastery, by the way, when it comes to the location itself. But the monastery has some pretty interesting quests and a very different approach to the main story. The early quests in the swamp are pretty decent as well, although I think the quests you get in the monastery are a bit more interesting. Your main goal is to get the chance to talk with the Don if you want to join him, which is exactly what I did. You'll have a couple of ways to do this by choosing different options while solving quests. You want me to do this job or not? This would be a good time to talk about the quest in general. If you played at least one game from this studio, you won't be surprised how the quests work in Reason. They usually give you at least a couple of options to solve a quest, and there are some actual gameplay consequences. But don't tell him I told you. It's basically everything you want to see from quests in RPGs. It's not just about choosing between A or B, the depth and the flexibility of these quests might take you by surprise. You can find yourself doing a lengthy side quest, and by the end of it, it turns out it's somehow related to the main quest. A lot of quests are connected, which makes the side quests a lot more enjoyable to do. The options you get while doing a quest just makes them even better. There is actually no way to experience this without replaying the game, which you'll probably do once or twice if you end up liking it. So yeah, the quest system is one of the reasons for such a strong replay value. The game has a more than a couple of very memorable characters. However, Reason has a huge problem with different character models or the lack of them. This was a common problem in games with lower budget, especially back then. I had the same criticism for the previous game I covered, which also came out in 2009. Divinity 2 Ego Draconis had the exact same issue. This can still be a problem nowadays for smaller studios, but it's not nearly as bad as it was 13 years ago. What makes Reason characters memorable is their personality and pretty solid voice acting. With gold. With gold, you can fight power. The lack of unique looking character models is definitely a big problem, but not to the point where it ruins my experience when interacting with these NPCs. Then we have the dialogue, which is usually extensive, but it never becomes tedious or boring. You always have more than a couple of things to select, either to get some info about the quest or just something that's usually relevant for the conversation. Keep searching, Rufo. <laughs> yeah, good wolf. The game has an abundance of NPCs that you can talk to, especially in populated places. One of my favorite things about this dialogue system is the extra XP you can get from just talking to people. The game usually doesn't even tell you about this, so it kinda feels rewarding when you figure it out by yourself. To give you an example, let's say you complete a quest and you no longer have it in your quest log. Then you randomly discover an additional dialogue line with one of the NPCs who were related to the quest and you get some more bonus XP. It's a really nice touch and it's nothing new when it comes to Piranabytes games. They do this in pretty much all of their games. This only encourages you to initiate a dialogue with everyone, even after you've already done the quest they have. I would say this makes the game more dynamic and a bit more immersive. Now let's talk about the visuals. If you played this game only on Xbox back in the day, you will probably think it's one of the worst looking games on that console, but the PC version looks pretty damn good. Especially if you can play it in 4K resolution like I did. My PC is average at best for today's standards and I had to make some compromises when it comes to the graphical settings. I had to set a couple of settings to medium so I can get steady 60 FPS. Well, for the most part at least. I mean the game is pretty old, but it still looks great and the environment has a lot of detail. The vegetation is extremely dense in some areas, which is one of the major reasons why the environments look so good. Sicily was actually the inspiration for the island of Aranga and I guess it's not so hard to see the resemblance. The island of Aranga is absolutely gorgeous. 
And even though we're talking about a single island, a lot of these areas manage to create a distinctive atmosphere. For example, the swamp feels pretty depressive. One of the reasons for that is the subtle fog and just the overall visual design of this place. It's also kinda creepy at night. The majority of other areas are a bit more colorful with brighter atmosphere. However, Reason doesn't exactly have a very bright color palette. The colors are noticeably desaturated actually, but the game still manages to create a warm atmosphere. Although that's not only because of the visuals. All NPCs in Reason have a day and night schedule, just like every other Piranha Bytes game. It's another major reason why these locations feel so lived in and why they create such a great atmosphere. Anyway, it feels to me like the game has a brownish pastel filter. They obviously wanted to replicate the same feeling from the first two Gotti games. But that grimy feel doesn't really work that well in such tropical environment if you ask me. It seems like Piranha Bytes agrees with me on this, because the sequels had much vibrant colors. Maybe not so much when it comes to Reason 2, but Reason 3 had a very bright color palette. The brownish filter of Reason 1 is very dominant, but I don't mind it a lot. Although it does kinda seem forced a bit. I guess the criticism for the vibrant colors of Gothic 3 really got to them. A lot of Gothic games thought this game looks too colorful compared to previous installments. But no matter how you feel about the color palette, the atmosphere in Piranha Bytes games was always amazing and Reason is no different. The textures of the environment are a mixed bag. Well, for today's standards at least. There is a very noticeable difference in pixel count on different environmental assets. Bigger rocks and similar assets have a much lower pixel density compared to something like buildings, trees and the armor on the character models. That's not a big deal because the game looks pretty damn good on high resolutions anyway, but it's worth mentioning. Fun fact, I'm pretty sure that Gothic 3 had way better pixel density in general. That's kinda mind-blowing if you think about it because the world in that game was massive and this game came out before Reason 1. Although that also explains why this game ran like crap. It's the game by the same studio, by the way, if you didn't know already. Saying that it was not optimized is a huge understatement. By the way, I recently did a video about Gothic 3 where I discussed this topic so you can check that out if you're interested. Yeah, I'm simping for Gothic 3 again, big fucking surprise. Anyway, the worst thing when it comes to visuals in Reason 1 is this permanent film grain effect, I guess. It's a static effect which is the most noticeable in the harbor town on the white buildings. It moves with your camera and it looks ridiculously bad, I wish we can turn it off. As far as I'm aware we can't, but it's not so bad outside the harbor town I guess. Oh and by the way, Reason is just another game from that time period that overuses the blur effect. For some odd reason, the majority of game studios back then thought the blur effect is the future I guess. Now let's talk about the gameplay. I have to say how much I love the early game in Reason. Right from the very beginning you have more than a couple of different paths to choose and secrets to find if you're curious enough. This might seem logical because it's an open world game after all, but it's not exactly like that. This island is extremely vertical with very dense vegetation and a lot of narrow passages. This means that you can usually get to a certain place on the map by following a single path. So it's not exactly your typical open world map with huge open areas. It does have a couple of wide open areas to explore, but there is a bigger emphasis on the verticality and interconnectivity. More than often the regular dungeons and caves you get to explore have multiple entrances, so you can use them as shortcuts which is very useful. Later in the game you'll find various teleporting stones which will eliminate a lot of backtracking. Although I think they should be available from the very beginning of the game. I think they become available somewhere in chapter 3, which is quite late in the game. I guess Piranha Bytes wanted to encourage players to fully explore the map before you get to teleport all over the place. And that's fine because the exploration in this game is stellar. But you're going to spend quite some time on backtracking before you get those teleportation stones, which can definitely be very annoying. Especially because your character moves like this. Yeah, that's your max speed. There is a useful sprint spell that you can get though, even if you're not a mage. I recommend buying this scroll every time you see it on a merchant. Speaking of that, Reason's gameplay has a huge emphasis on a couple of utility spells. Up to the point where you can get stuck and cannot progress further if you don't have those spells. I'm not only talking about the side content in the game, this goes for the main story as well. Come to think of it, especially for the main story. Levitation, transformation and telekinesis are absolutely mandatory in a lot of situations. Reason has a lot of puzzles that you have to solve when you're exploring the temple ruins. These puzzles are not extremely hard to figure out, but they are not brain dead either. 
I think Piranha Bytes managed to strike a nice balance between challenge and fun when it comes to these puzzles. And it almost always has to do something with those three spells I mentioned. Once you figure that out, you know what to look for and what to expect from these puzzles. If you're playing as a mage, those spells will be more accessible. However, even if you're not a mage, it's not really hard to get your hands on a couple of spell scrolls. Although there was a point in the game where I spent around 30 minutes trying to find an appropriate NPC who can sell me some levitation scrolls. It's not a bad idea to learn how to make scrolls, but I decided to dump most of my ability points into sword and strength as soon as possible. Because of course I did. Another quite important aspect of Reason's exploration are the maps you're going to collect. I had a lot of praise for Gati games for having very simple yet very useful in-game maps which you actually have to find or buy. Reason had the same idea, they just took it even further. Unlike most modern open world games, Reason has a very simple map design with just some basic information. But if you ask me, it's all you need from an in-game map. I can't express enough how much I hate the modern idea of an in-game map. That's because they usually feel like a high-tech Google map system rather than a proper in-game map. Although this depends on the setting of the game itself, I guess. For example, it makes more sense for the Cyberpunk to have a high-tech in-game map with a lot of details, but not so much in The Witcher 3. Where did Geralt get all of this high-tech stuff all of a sudden? I'm looking for a whore. Anyway, Reason has a dozen of maps to find and each of them are useful. You start off with no maps at all and you'll quickly find the most basic map. As you progress through the game, you'll find a better world map as well as a lot of local maps of different areas. It's not like you're not able to figure out what to do in Temple Ruins without a local map, but it's a lot easier to get around if you find one. And they also have some subtle tips as well. Reason has a quest map as well, but these are not exactly quest marks. For example, you can see who gave you the quest on the map, and sometimes the location of your objective if there is no reason for it to be hidden. But whenever you get a quest where you have to figure things out by yourself, the quest map won't help you a lot. I'm not a huge fan of quest marks in general, so I like this quite a bit. Come to think of it, this is probably the most natural way of including quest marks without actually including them. For example, the map already has the location of the temples, so the quest marks just show you the location. But if a quest is more mysterious, the game won't have a quest mark that shows you exactly what to do, that's what I mean. It's kinda logical when you think about it. Just get out of here. Now let's finally talk about the combat system. Just like the majority of features in Reason, the combat heavily resembles the first two gothic games. The melee combat system is based on combos and the precise timing of your attacks. That means that you'll find the most success with your attacks by pressing the attack button right after the previous attack animation ends. Doing this successfully will make your melee attacks a lot faster than simply spamming the attack button. If you don't time your attacks properly, the attack combo will be noticeably slower, which can get you hit more easily. The feel of this melee combat can be very decent and rewarding once you figure it out. You can also actively block and stab dodge to avoid getting hit. Blocking is definitely the most effective defensive move. I try to focus more on the stab dodge ability, but blocking just works a lot better and it's a lot easier to use. The step dodge can be very useful as well, especially against some specific enemy types. More than often, it can leave your opponents open for some free damage, so it's worth using. However, dodging feels very stiff in this game, which can discourage some people from using it. It takes a while for a character to recover from the animation lock, and that's probably the main reason why it feels so stiff. But the core problem of not just the combat system, but the controls in general, is the camera. First of all, the sensitivity for the camera is way too high and there is no option in the menu to reduce it. This was a much bigger issue on the Xbox version because on PC you can control the sensitivity in Windows. But still, that's not an excuse for the lack of sensitivity options in the menu. Getting used to high sensitivity is not the only issue though. The camera in this game just has a mind of its own. For example, when you're falling down, the camera just refuses to follow your character until you land on something. It feels extremely janky and unpolished. The combat has a soft lock-on system which can keep the enemy at focus as long as you can see their names. When you start attacking, the camera can have very aggressive turns because the camera closely follows the attack animation. And like I said before, it's especially stiff once you use the step dodge. You completely lose the control of your camera until the step dodge animation ends. So no matter how hard you try to turn around and face the enemy, you'll be stuck until the animation ends. But to be fair, when you start attacking, the game is usually smart enough to instantly target the nearest enemy. But still, the camera controls are pretty awful in those situations. 
The melee combat itself, however, is probably the best that Piranha Bytes ever made. That might not say much, since the melee combat in their games is usually not that great, to put it lightly. But with reason, they managed to strike a nice balance between the challenge, mechanics and the general feel of the combat, even though it's far from being amazing. Once you start investing your points into melee combat skills of your choice, it gets even better. Just like in Gothic 1 and 2, you can gradually unlock more moves and animations. For example, lateral attacks makes it easier to hit multiple enemies on the screen. You're usually going to fight multiple enemies anyway, so learning how to do this feels quite rewarding. Although the power attack is probably the strongest move, even against multiple enemies. However, you'll have to spend a lot of points until you're able to get it. This progression system is a bit more linear compared to something like Gothic 3 and Piranha Bytes newer games, but it works pretty well. You can't exactly choose which of these combat moves to unlock first, that's what I mean by linear. I went with a two-handed sword on this playthrough and I had a lot of fun, even though my build was pretty simple. I tried to use a bow as well, but I didn't spend a lot of points to improve my dexterity, so my damage was always kinda low with the bow. And to be honest, using a bow in this game doesn't feel really good. It lacks the impact and it feels really floaty. The range gameplay in Gothic 3 was far superior if you ask me. As for the other notable combat moves that you get to unlock, there is a parry mechanic and a counter parry as well. But I feel like this mechanic is not rewarding enough. It's not extremely hard to pull off, but the damage you deal after the parry is usually equivalent to the regular attack. Not always though. Sometimes the enemy would take a lot more damage, so I guess there is a critical chance mechanic or something like that, I can't say for sure. And that extra damage from the parry was only noticeable in the early game. By the time I'd entered chapter 3, it seemed like the damage from the counter parry didn't matter at all. I was still using this mechanic because it can be a great opener even without the extra damage. It's supposed to be a high risk, high reward mechanic, but unfortunately it's only high risk in reason 1. Speaking about extra damage, I think the balancing of the game is pretty decent when it comes to the hard difficulty. Reason tends to really punish you for your mistakes, which means you can easily get killed, especially in these situations. But at the same time, you can easily mow down multiple enemies on the screen if you position yourself right and execute a good combo. Although I found the power attack the most useful in these situations. You just move out of the way and use your power attack a couple of times, it's probably the safest way to play, if not a bit cheesy. You can still get killed even like this, especially because Risen's combat is very fast paced actually. Compared to the floaty and slow paced melee combat from Gothic 3, Risen's melee combat is better in every single way possible. Piranha Bytes managed to find a good balance between the challenge and fun, despite some problems I mentioned. The sequel to Reason had a similar idea when it comes to combat, but somehow it managed to feel a lot worse. Reason 3 had some improvements on this field, although the combat in that game can feel really floaty. And the sequels were hyper focused on the whole pirate theme, to their detriment if you ask me. This pirate setting just puts some big limitations on the combat in general, since you're supposed to fight like a, well, a pirate. While Reason 1 gave you a completely blank character with no defined gameplay style. Granted, Reason 1 only had a couple of unique playstyles, but all of them are pretty good. I didn't even mention the mage playstyle, which unlocks if you join the Inquisition. There are some pretty fun spells to cast and it's arguably the most fun way to experience the game. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of footage of the mage gameplay since I played the game like a warrior. Like I said, you're probably going to beat the whole game at least twice if you end up liking it, so you can experience both of these playstyles. There are different options within these playstyles as well, so it's not like the game only has two different builds. But compared to other Piranha Bytes games, the options you have in Reason are quite limited. Considering the length of the game, Reason 1 offers you just enough options to play your character for at least a couple of playthroughs. When it comes to some other gameplay related things, I just have to mention how awful it feels to jump in this game. Like I said before, the camera is one of the reasons, but jumping by itself is awful. What's also kinda disappointing is the lack of mage enemies throughout the game. 99% of NPCs you're going to fight will face you in melee range. Technically, the Saurians have NPCs who can cast spells, but you can beat the entire game without even knowing that. That's because as soon as you get close to attack them, they'll immediately attack you in melee range. For this whole playthrough, I think I only saw a couple of Saurians in total trying to hit me with a spell. So you don't even have to worry about the magic resistance stat, Items which grant you this protection are completely useless. It's probably a bit different story if you play as a mage, because you'll try to keep the distance between you and the enemies. 
that will make the mage NPCs actually use their spells, but still, the game has very one-dimensional enemies because it's almost all about the melee combat. Reason has included the ability to grab on ledges, which was absent in Gothic 3. This mechanic is functional enough and it's kinda mandatory for exploring the map. Here's a little tip which will make your exploration a lot better in general. If you do a couple of quests for Patty in Harbor Town, she can teach you the acrobatic skill. You'll thank me later. The itemization in Reason is decent as well. Just like all Piranha Bytes games, Reason is very conservative with the armor sets you can get. You need to progress the rank with your faction so you can unlock a new armor set. Every other miscellaneous item you can equip can be found, bought or crafted. Those are usually going to be rings and amulets. The only reason you have a helmet slot is for the mandatory helmet piece you'll have to equip at the very end of the game. That's a pretty stupid design if you ask me, because the player can spend the whole game hoping to find some helmets to equip. As for the weapons, there is a decent amount of different types to find, and the quantity of weapons is just perfect if you ask me. Especially if we take in consideration that Reason is not a very long game, you'll need about 30 to 40 hours to finish a playthrough. What I really like about weapons in general is that you're able to find them while exploring. And I'm not just talking about common weapons you'll find all over the place. I have found this cool tool handler in one of the temples I explored and I used it quite a bit. The game introduces new weapons and items when you progress through chapters, when merchants will replenish their stock. But my personal preference when it comes to stronger weapons in RPGs is the ability to find them while exploring the world. And Reason didn't disappoint with this. The crafting seems to work a little bit different than you would expect, but I didn't play with it a lot. You can learn how to collect ore from various places on the map, and then you can bring the smith the required materials so he can craft items for you. But you can also craft items for yourself. Speaking about creating items, you can learn how to do alchemy as well. For the majority of my playthrough, I struggle with healing potions, so it's a good idea to stack them whenever you can before you start exploring the map. Learning how to make potions is probably really useful, but I just didn't bother with this skill. Like I said, I wanted to improve my combat skills with the sword as soon as possible. Now you might remember that I mentioned in the beginning that Reason feels unfinished, so let's talk a little bit about that. I already touched upon the underwhelming lore, which is one of the major reasons why the game feels unfinished to me. That's the same reason why I think the game needs at least one more chapter which would possibly focus on the lizard people and their history. The Saurians, I mean. The second major reason is the lack of side quests and things to do in general in the last two chapters. If you did the majority of side quests in the first two chapters, all of a sudden the only thing that's left to do is the main quest. Not to mention that you can fail most of the side quests. I actually love when RPGs have the option to fail the quest because this makes them feel a bit more real. Piranha Bytes have always held the immersion in high regard, so this really makes sense when you think about it. If something happens in the world and the NPC who gave you the quest disappears or gets killed, it's logical that you'll fail the quest that he gave you. There can be a lot more reasons for failing the quest, these are just the most obvious. But yeah, I feel like the last two chapters should have a lot more quests to do. Either that, or they could have just moved some of these quests for later chapters. It's not like the game lacks the quests in general, you can get a ton of them in the first chapter alone. Although this could also depend on how you play the game, you might discover some of these quests in later chapters. But I assume most people will explore the map as much as possible as soon as they get a chance, which will result in picking up a lot of quests. So why don't you just fuck off? Before we start talking about the spoilers, I have to say that the ending of this game is really disappointing. You'll basically spend the whole chapter gathering the pieces for this special armor set, which is the coolest armor set in the game. But you don't even get the chance to properly use it, it's only for the purposes of dealing with the end game boss. It makes sense from the narrative standpoint, but from the gameplay perspective it's pretty bad. I mean, I don't have to explain why getting the best armor set in a game and only being able to use it for about 10 minutes is bad, right? That brings us to the spoiler section and you can skip this part by clicking on the next chapter. Your main objective in Reason is to kill the Titan, who is threatening to destroy the island. Inquisitor Mendoza believes he can control the Titan, but it turns out he was wrong, unsurprisingly. He actually double-crosses you when you get all the items which are needed to open the main gate in the temple. No matter which side you choose in the beginning, you'll have to work with the Inquisitor Mendoza. And the story always ends the same, there are no multiple endings like in Gothic 3. 
Once you obtain all of the armor pieces, you can finally step through the gate to face the Titan. But before that, you'll have to fight the Inquisitor. It's a pretty disappointing fight to be honest, but what's even more disappointing is the fight with the Titan. And there is a very obvious plot hole at the end of the game. Apparently you wouldn't even be able to see the Titan without this ocular that the Inquisitor is using. That explains why no one else saw the sea Titan in the beginning cutscene. But you don't actually have to equip this item, you only need it in your inventory. You're still going to wear the helmet in these fights. Okay? That's not exactly the worst thing about this fight, not by long shot. The game thinks it's a good idea to give you some tutorial tips about this fight. What? That's beyond stupid, but what's even worse is the fight itself. Come to think of it, it's not even a fight, it's more of a platforming section. You just need to watch out for the disappearing floor and avoid a couple of attacks from the Titan. Actually, it's only one single ranged attack and it doesn't even matter that much even if it hits you, unless the platform below you disappears. Then eventually, you get the opportunity to smack the Titan in the head, and you repeat that a couple of times until the fight is done. It's a terrible boss fight, although the presentation is kinda cool, I'll give it that. I beat the Titan in one single try, even though I completely forgot how the fight works. It's not a very memorable fight, to say the least. I'm not exactly sure if the difficulty affects the fight or not, but it doesn't even matter. The game rolls the credits right after the fight and there is a subtle hint about the sequel. But yeah, man, I really wish this game had a more fleshed out lore. The Saurians have a very cool visual design and it would be very interesting to learn a bit more about them. They could have easily included a couple of passive Saurian NPCs that you could talk to. But nope, they are just a very boring enemy. The people from the Inquisition are worshipping some sort of holy flame, which has to be guarded by any means in the monastery. Even though this thing has a physical form, it's more like an entity than anything else. So it's kinda logical that it remains a mystery throughout the entire game, although it turns out it doesn't really matter that much. The holy flame has to be protected. Why? Nobody knows. It sounds useful, but I can't do anything with it. Back to the spoiler-free section. Like I said, the most disappointing thing about this game is the ending. Not to the point where it could ruin your whole experience with the game, but still, it's definitely not good. The second biggest problem that I had might be a bit subjective. I just think the game feels unfinished and I already explained why. Despite all of that, I still think that Reason is one of the best games from this studio. It's not exactly good as gothic games if you ask me, but it came close to that. Reason games had an amazing potential, but the sequels were mediocre games at best, unfortunately. We'll cover the sequels in some of the future videos, don't worry. A couple of months ago, I ranked all Piranha Bytes RPGs in one of my videos, and if you wanna see how I ranked Reason, make sure to check that out. When it comes to the music, the great Kai Rosecrans was the composer for the Reason soundtrack. This is the same guy that composed the music for Gatti games and once again he did a phenomenal job. The tracks in this game are simply amazing and they fit perfectly within the setting of this game. As for the sound effects, it's a mixed bag. Ah! The environmental well, sound effects are pretty good, goes. and this is another reason for that great atmosphere which the game seamlessly creates. The combat sound effects are mediocre at best, but they give a certain weight to their attacks. And I think they sound a lot better compared to the sound effects from the sequels, by the way. Although I wish that some of them are a bit louder, like the blocking effects. The voice acting is pretty good in the game. Go and find if my people are still loyal. Uh, one more thing. Yes. The Inquisitor. Gather all the information you can about him. I'm pretty sure that all major characters have unique voices and they sound pretty good. Although you're going to hear the same voice actor for different NPCs and it's not so hard to tell. We found a sword pommel. Show a little respect, little fish. But considering the amount of NPCs you're going to talk to, it's to be expected. A lot of voice actors have a British accent, and I guess that's also to be expected since the game is made in Europe. I want payment. A decent payment. Or you can both piss off. You can't go wrong with British accents, by the way. Now let's talk about the infamous Xbox version. I bought the digital version on the Xbox Store for my Xbox One. This is probably one of the worst ways you can spend $20, by the way. This console port is obviously not done by Piranha Bytes, they obviously hired a studio to port the game. And whoever developed this port did an awful job. 
but those guys are not the only one to blame because apparently it was done under the close supervision of Piranabytes. First of all, the game looks like crap, especially compared to the PC version. Some of these textures look like they came straight from the late 90s game, it's that bad. They obviously did this to try and optimize the performance, but they did a horrible job with this as well. Your eyes are going to bleed from the low FPS when you try to explore the populated areas. I can't exactly measure the FPS on the console, but I can say for sure this is lower than 20 FPS. Now listen, I don't have a problem with playing games on 30 FPS as long as the frame rate is somewhat consistent. But this kind of performance is totally unacceptable. However, when I did some research, it seems like the current gen Xbox consoles fixed the frame rate issue. Reason seems to run at 60 FPS on Xbox Series X, which is great. It still looks like crap though. Putting all of that aside, the Xbox version has some serious issues with the controls. I already touched upon the sensitivity issues, which is predominantly a problem on the Xbox version of the game. The camera controls have a crazy high sensitivity and there is nothing you can do about it. But what's even worse in my opinion are the combat controls. That's because it's very easy to accidentally press the jump button when you want to use the step dodge. This is because the game uses the same button for jumping and dodging. But the PC doesn't have this issue even though it uses the same button to jump and dodge as well. You can use the strafe buttons on PC and easily step dodge because you never have to press W button to move forward. That's obviously not the case with the Xbox controller since you're going to move with the left stick. It's much easier to mess this up and it makes dodging very tedious. And that's pretty much everything I have to say about this god awful Xbox port. Whatever you do, don't play it. I managed to make a little deal with people from GOG, so if by any chance you want to try out this game, you can get a huge discount by using my code, not only for Reason 1, but the whole Reason franchise. The code is click for reason which actually sounds a lot better than my real channel name. The deal ends on September 10th, so be sure to use my link in the description, which will lead you to the GOG store where you can enter the code. If you like the video and you want to support my channel directly, I also have a Patreon page. But hey, the best way to support the channel is free by just subscribing, liking the video and maybe sharing it with your friends. Big thanks to all of my supporters on Patreon and all the YouTube members. That will be all and I'll see you in the next one.